Hey everybody, Red Mage here. Welcome back to this channel. Uh, this video is going to be part two of my deep dive into the halls of Arden Vol. In this video, I'm not exactly sure what I'm going to be doing except kind of going through the floors that I've read through in a lot of detail and talking about them, looking at the way that they're laid out, looking at the sort of encounters that you're going to run into, the factions that you're going into, and just kind of giving a sense of what I find to be so incredible about these different uh, these different places, these different dungeons, essentially. I mean, they're, they're complete dungeons. You could take them out and run them on their own. It wouldn't be quite as <laughs> quite as cool as running them as part of this huge mega dungeon. But man, there's so much in these in these floors. So much to love. Now, before I get into it too much, I wanted to give a shout out to 3D6 down the line. No, in my last video, I didn't mention it. I wasn't actually aware of it at the time. But man, there was like every comment on that video was like, you gotta check it out, you gotta check it out. So I went to that channel and man, that's awesome. So yeah, thumbs up, that, that's really cool. And I think, you know, that's gonna be a better, uh, a better appreciation, it's gonna give you a better appreciation for this dungeon than these, this series would. Because actually seeing a, a play of it, right, actually getting to see how it runs at the table, that's so, if, there's, there's really nothing better just to get a sense of what actually is gonna happen at the table. So I highly recommend checking that out. It's a, it's a long series, but man, totally worth it. Uh, this is going to be much more, you know, academic kind of bird's eye view. I haven't run this, so uh, I want to, and I'm, I'm seriously tempted to uh, slot this in for my next like two year campaign. <laughs> Not running through the entirety of it, but I've been thinking about what I'm gonna do next in the in, in long term, once the third book comes out, I want to do the um, Gods of the Forbidden North. That's my kind of, you know, I wanna, I wanna run that campaign once it's all done. Uh, part two is being completed right now, uh, but but once part three is out, then I wanna, I wanna run that. I also was thinking about Dolmenwood. Once Dolmenwood comes out this summer, or the end of summer in September, I think is when it's supposed to come out. But man, this is a huge contender now, the Halls of Ardenvold. Um, so I'm gonna talk to my players about what they might be more interested in, and we'll see. I kind of hope that they pick a big mega dungeon dungeon crawl because I think that would be really cool to run this. But um, in the meantime, uh, I'm just going to read through it and yeah, kind of you know vicariously imagine what it would be like to to run a game here. I want to go through, you know, just carefully uh, the different ways or the different the different parts of the dungeon at the at the uh, surface level. Just going through the pyramid of Toth. I think I'll skip over the the tower for now and then go right into floor one, two, and three and talk about them. Uh, really, floor three. You really have to read floor four with it, but I just don't think I'll have time to do that in all detail. So, I'll certainly do one, two, and and maybe three. We'll see. Uh, the first part of th of three, perhaps. Now, the pyramid of Toth is a great place to start, great for a number of reasons. As as a way to get down into the dungeon, it stands out, right? It's the pyramid. It's the thing that when you enter Ardenvol, the ruined city at the top, you're gonna to be describing the pyramid, the players are gonna see it, they're gonna be interested in going to check it out. It's the thing that stands out. And so it's great that that's the way, the primary way down into the, down into the dungeon proper, down to level three. And it's interesting that level three kind of is, at least in my mind, level three is kind of the first actual floor of the dungeon. Level two is, I mean, it's certainly accessible, but it's a little bit harder to find the entrances to two, I think. And the stuff that's going on in two is a little less typical of the dungeon as a whole. I mean, you have the baboons, the, the, the giant apes, right? Uh, the, the white apes. And that's uh, that's going to it's have its own vibe, basically. <laughs> but Floor 3, really, to me, seems like where you really start to get into what the dungeon as a whole, the mega dungeon as a whole, feels like. Where you, well, you know, and I think you'll see it as we go through it. But the Pyramid of, is a great way of introducing that concept. But there's enough, like, stuff to manipulate here, enough stuff to find and to, to, to maneuver, that it's actually pretty, pretty uh, interesting in and of itself. You have this giant statue of Toth the Glorious, and you have to be careful how you manipulate its arms, because if you manipulate them wrong, you're going to go down the bad path. And if you, if you manipulate them right, you're going to go down the right path, the right path leading you down to floor three. The wrong path leading you, theoretically, to the abyss, if you want. <laughs> I mean, it really can't go wrong really fast really, really fast. Probably not, but it could if you wanted to do it that way. 
Uh, so what what I really like about it in, in for number I'm gonna oops that's too zoom in too much yeah I'll just I'll just use this I guess um, what I really like about the pyramid is the the introduction in terms of tone for example uh, up three as you're going down which is the proper proper way you get tons of graffiti and the graffiti gives you different eras different references to different factions you might be running into. I would really play up that graffiti. I would do like a ton of it to give the players different, especially if I was doing this as a West Marches, but but in particular, just if you're doing it as a, as a regular campaign, as a way of introducing the players to a bunch of different concepts of things they're gonna run into. So Kerbor Khan, for example, uh, me mentioning the Great Chasm, uh, talking about various adventuring parties are gonna run into the halflings that are right there at the bottom of, of, of the landing to three, lots of things that will give the players an indication of what they're about to go into. I love that use of graffiti, and this dungeon definitely uses it throughout. So I think that's really, really great. Um, so the path from, from the surface down to three, uh, down to floor three, I should say, is is great. It's, it's very clear that it's been used a lot. It's very clear that it's open. It's the easier, I think, of the two arm configurations on the statue to figure out, and so you're more likely to find it. But what's interesting is that the other way the unworn stairs, the dangerous entrance, is very clearly not used very much, and it's very clearly bad. Like, it, it's, there's something awful here. Now, it shuts after an hour, so you open it up, you're gonna be, you're gonna have an hour of walking up and down the stairs and figuring out, oh, this is dangerous, this place seems like it is really hard. There's, a there's, there's dead bodies everywhere, there are, um, you know, the, the sorts of graffiti you're running into here is different, the, the, it's clearly unworn. This is something that hasn't been explored as much. And that sense of this is an area that hasn't been explored as much, really very quickly will get your players into the mindset of this is a dangerous place. If it hasn't been explored, if it hasn't been uncovered yet, it's probably dangerous. Because Ardenvol has been, you know, the, the subject, the object of many adventuring parties expeditions over the years leading up to it, and there are currently many adventuring parties trying to go into it. There's a ton of rival adventuring parties. So a lot of the upper floors, like the most dangerous stuff, is known or is indicated or is just, it's very clearly, you know, regularly traveled, so you can't have these horrible death traps, right, in a regularly traveled hallway or something like that. And the dungeon is really good about, about being consistent in that way. If it's an area that has a lot of activity, a lot of people coming in and out, it's probably not going to have horrible death traps, right? Um, or at least if it does, it's going to be, there's going to be a reason why this death trap is here and why it hasn't been triggered yet or why it's reset every time it's triggered or something like that. Either it's a faction that is putting it together or most people know about it or it's obvious or it's, or it's very subtle and hides some secret that the players, uh, that no one has discovered yet. So similarly with this, the unworn stairs, the dangerous entrance is very clearly, um, it's very clearly untouched or less touched. And there's corpses right away. You're like, okay, this is probably going to be a place that is harder. And indeed it is. It's a very deadly death trap. It locks, you're trapped down there, and there are lots of ways to just kill you off quickly. If you're a low-level party, you're just dead, basically. Uh, the graffiti is very despairing. There's this idea of the scorpion. You've got to find the scorpion, but it's not all the way until room 11. And in order to find it, you kind of have to fall down into the lair and you have to climb through the lair and there are these Verontes demons or Verontes demons, which are going to kill a low-level party. I mean, they've got 28, 26, 24, 21 hit points. Um, or four hit dice. <laughs> there are three of them. And they, re they reform. And so if you don't find the solution to this, they're going to just eat you. So if you go down this dangerous path, you're probably going to lose the party. But... The players will be like, man, we should have seen this coming. And even then, there's a way out. If they find the scorpion, if they find the way to do it. So, and there's treasure down here. Not a ton, but enough that it makes it like, okay, it's not the end of the world if we find it. Now, one of the things that happens here is that if you do find your way out, you teleport to a random location. Uh, and, and those, <laughs> they, you could be teleported right into something very, very, very dangerous for a low-level party. So if you are brand new, the players happen to find this and they persist, that party's probably going to be wiped. So the kind of game, I mean, it'll tell you right away, tell your players right away the kind of game you're playing, just by the very introduction to the Pyramid of Toth, if they go wrong. Now, if they don't, then they're going to go down to floor, floor three and definitely doable. But, uh, but this is the sort of mindset that 
runs through the entirety of the dungeon. That's why I wanted to spend some time with it. It's brilliant. Two paths, one harder to find, and when you find it, very clearly less traveled. More dangerous, more obviously dangerous. So if the players persist, they are going to pay the penalty if they're not careful. That's basically the whole dungeon, in a nutshell. The, the deeper you go, the more unexplored a region is, the more likely you are to run into a thing that could kill you instantly if you're not careful. Or kill you quickly if you're not careful. And that's what you see here. I'm going to skip the Tower of Scrutiny for now. It's interesting. I mean, it's kind of cool, in fact. Uh, but it just... It's it's fairly straightforward, right? There's just a bunch of wraiths going around, um, and you're trying to get out, uh, trying not to get get wrecked. <laughs> the well of wraiths is a kind of cool idea. the The ruined wooden staircases going up to the the top floor are really deadly. That's that's brutal. It has like a fifty percent chance of, of breaking, I think, or something like that every time a person goes up it. Well, that's real rough. Um, let's see, it's room eleven. Which one is that? That is uh, floating stairs. Yeah, 50% chance of anything weighing 50 pounds or more causes the stairs to collapse. If that's the case, you fall 50, 50 feet to the basement, taking 5 to 30 hit point damage along the way. Um, there's a continual darkness spell up there, and then you hit the bottom and you're going to get attacked by wraiths. So, yeah, definitely, definitely that you're going to lose a party member if they, if you climb up those steps and it breaks. So, anyway, it's a cool dungeon. It's a cool little, like, one-shot dungeon, though, or a little, uh, you know, you could, you could easily add this into another campaign. It seems less connected to a lot of the stuff going on. Okay, I want to talk about the basement because this is technically... Um, the basement is considered to be the first level of the dungeon. And it is. But it is... It's definitely more introductory. Like, this, this to me feels much more like, if you've read Barrow Maze, it feels much more like one of the random barrows that you run into on the surface rather than the Barrow Maze itself. That's how I feel about the basement. It is... It does have entrances from the city, and it does have access to different floors down below. You can go to floor 3 or floor 5, uh, if you find them, from this dungeon. But really, I think the way to think about this is much more like, here is an introduction to the kind of thing you're going to be doing without getting in over your head. You're fighting a lot of vermin. There are and There is an NPC to interact with who has a secret that you can discover kind of by searching through this place and also that connects to other floors. There are lots of tricks and traps and, and things to figure out as you go through. So it's a great, like, tonal introduction. These are the sorts of things you're going to be doing in the dungeon as a whole, but they're much easier. There's no, like, instant death traps, or at least none that I saw. The, the death traps are slow. Like, if you persist, you will be crushed by the falling ceiling sort of thing. Um, and there's also stuff that connects to floors and to the surface. So in room one, for example, you can find a bit of the large statue, which is back on the surface, which you need to put together um, in order to... to uh, put the, the, the colossal statue of Arden, in other words. So you put together all the pieces of Arden and you get a, a boon from doing so. One of the pieces is in here. So there's this connection to something on the surface. There are connections to NPCs or to lower levels of the floor with uh, Lankios, the hermit. Uh, there are passages down below, there are passages up to the ceiling, and lots of stuff to encounter on this floor. More more uh, bestial than uh, undead, although there are some undead here as well. And also there are dead adventurers to, to loot. And that's another thing too, right? The dead adventurers tell you what they're going to, what you should be aware of. It's another good thing to, to, to use in this dungeon and to be aware of is that when you run into dead creatures in the dungeon, you should pay attention. Right? It'll give you an indication, your player's an indication of what they're about to face. That's another great attention to detail that the designers have done. They put dead bodies throughout this, these dungeons, but they always are there, almost always are there, to indicate a danger that the players are now forewarned about. Because they've seen the body, if they investigate it, if they're clever, if they see what killed them and they, they, they discern that, then they can be prepared a bit for what might be just around the corner or what might have killed them. Uh, and then they'll might not make the same mistakes. So that's a really cool way of rewarding player attention to things like little details. Well, little details, like a dead body, for example. It's not just, hey, this is a dangerous area, but, oh, for example, these corpses, uh, they have been they show signs of severe poisoning, multiple sting injection marks, and necrotic blackened skin. Okay, so there's something down here that stings you and poisons you. Maybe if we are really afraid of that, maybe we should go get antitoxins before we come down here. Or maybe... You know, we'll, we'll try to focus on range rather than get up close on whatever we're going to fight down here. So, that sort of thing. Really like it. The giant centipedes are what uh, 
water coming. Although there's also the anti-vermin paste of Lankios the Hermit. If you happen to find that, then you can find ways of to completely, you know, disregarding the uh, the centipedes. If you happen to have that that paste and you use it, that's great. It's really useful. And there are, uh, you know, that's it's reminiscent of things you're going to do in the dungeon below, where you can find a way to completely bypass an encounter without fighting it by using some trick or some or some uh, feature from some other part of the dungeon. So I think this is a masterfully crafted introduction. But that's really what it is. It's an introduction, a tonal introduction. It's not the same sort of thing. It doesn't have the same sort of deadliness. It doesn't have the same sort of treasure. It doesn't have the same sort of NPC or faction play that the rest of the dungeon does. And I think even in the book, level one is described as like, if you're starting with a brand new party who doesn't know what a mega dungeon is, who doesn't have a lot of experience dungeon crawling, then start them off by directing them to the basement, level one. If they are more experienced, then maybe let them go into level two or level three. Like, have them kind of right off the bat be able to do that. Uh, Lankios the Hermit is awesome. Oh, also, the storeroom with the porter. There's a zombie porter you can get. He wears a dog collar and a silver chasing, or with the silver chasing around his neck. He'll follow you around. Uh, it will cause a negative reaction in civilized uh, locations, and it's slow, but hey, it's a porter who will carry more stuff for you. Uh, carry up to 200 pounds. That's great. Um, if you're willing to put up with it, that's a very that's a very valuable thing to have a free porter who can carry 200 pounds of weight. There are some downsides, and again, introduction to the kind of dungeon you're running into. There's a little whimsy to it, a little silliness to it, but that's a very valuable th valuable thing. I really like the one three silver chalice puzzle. The silver chalice uh, matters in room 12. You can find extra treasure with it. Again, the sort of idea of taking things from one room and applying them in another, uh, at your, which you're going to do all the time in the dungeon proper. Lankios is also interesting because it doesn't seem to me that there's any way very easily or quickly to find out what's going on with him. That will require then coming back if you want to deal with his really, really... Uh, you know, if you, if, you, if you want to deal with... completely understand who he is and what's going on. Um, you, you have to, you know, you really have to work at this. But that's cool. So if you, um, if you continually come back, if you go down and, and realize connections, then you can make this sort of a return place. And I think that is, again, something that you find in the dungeon. Usually you don't go to a floor of the dungeon, clear it out, and move on. Usually it's like we go through this portion of this floor, deal with this thing, realize it connects to this other floor, go to that floor and deal with it, and come back. It's a lot of that going on rather than clearing and moving. Um, so I think that's that's another great introduction to that idea. Is there's something going on with this guy. It relates to the dungeon. We don't know. We're going to have to come back and find out if we want to if we want to fully find out. So I like that a lot. Another thing that I really like about this floor is the, the sort of three wise monkeys trap effect stuff. It's it's ridiculous. It's absurd. But it's again the sort of thing you're going to run into into this dungeon. It gives you that tonal introduction. That, that there are going to be weird effects that are solved through perhaps weird solutions. And there's sort of a mythic underworld absurdity that comes along with a mega dungeon. You're not, it, and it, and it's one of the things that the dungeon is a bit, it's tonally tricky, I think, to at least in my mind, to figure out. Because on the one hand, the realism here is intense. The attention to detail, the historical depth, the, the fact that these places often just feel like real places. That's all there. And the, the detail of, again, history and, and setting and set design and the, the architectural features and the consistency of things like plaster and graffiti and all of that gives it a real sense of place. On the other hand, you also have kind of ridiculous mega dungeon tricks and hazards and traps. And, and that, I think, could be, depending on the group, it might be a tricky balance to, to walk, right? That sometimes you could have a, like, why is this here? And yeah, that's going to happen at times. It's okay if you can suspend your disbelief, right? And, and the, the dungeon, man, the dungeon gives you ample opportunity to suspend your disbelief. Tons and tons of help in that way. But it does come through at times. And I think this is one of them, right? Where you have these, like, three wise monkeys effect. It's like, why... Why is this here? Um, in what context would this have ever been put here? Why would this effect have ever been enchanted onto these things? Um, 
Well, I'm sure there's a reason you could come up with, but there's nothing really given, and the players are not certainly going to know. And that might happen at times. Why is this here? Even if there is a reason. You know, I think one of the temptations will be as a DM, I would feel this temptation all the time, is to tell my players' background that they would have no way of knowing. Right? Like, they'll run into something and it'll be weird, random, and they'll be like, why was that there? The temptation for me as a GM would be to be like, oh, uh, well, you guys don't know it yet, but that relates to... I, like, it would be very hard. I would have to practice a lot of discipline to not do that. And I think that you would want to not do that. In this sort of a dungeon, the value of having the players discover on their own even little bits of the backstory is really worth it. So that's one of the temptations I think that a GM will have to resist, is telling the players more than they would know in order to explain to the... Yeah, more than their characters would know in order to explain to the players that this isn't crazy, right? Or, or no, 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 it makes sense. Like, I think you're going to have to let them think things are crazy. And then maybe later they'll, maybe, <laughs> with a, you know, a major maybe, they will come to discover the truth of something and go, oh, I get it. I get it. Um, the collapsing ceiling in room 10 is the one I was referencing earlier. So it has a chance per round cumulative of caving in, but even when it caves in, it's a round by round effect. So you know, sometimes the dungeon doesn't do that, especially as you get lower. It'll be like, oh, the effect happened, save or die, right? <laughs> or even in some cases, just you're crushed and you know by a falling rock because you did the stupid thing and you did the obvious thing that the trap was designed to, to do. So yeah, you, you died. This one is like, no, you have some time. If you want to persist and hang out, then you're going to eventually be buried. Even then, you take some damage in the northern half and maybe you could dig yourself out. So it's gentle, floor one is, with the instant death traps, but it gives you the indication like, like you know, you, you got to be careful in this place. Again, cool. I like that idea. Uh, the, the mosaic room, room 12, has a lot of great ideas, and it has this um, altar with the poison needle trap, which you can you can skip if you have the chalice. So that's really cool from, from room 3. And the chalice on room 3 is like, you know, it's, it's, it's on a platform. It's very clearly intended to be important and like, a, hey, this is a clue to something. I might make some sort of connection to that on the altar. Maybe there's like a silver ring on the altar where you'd be like, hey, I wonder, would it fit the, would it fit the chalice? Be like, yeah, it would. You know, you don't have to always do that as you go through the rest of the dungeon, but initially it might be a good idea to let them know, hey, there's going to be a connection point uh, between things you find in the dungeon and solutions to puzzles later. And you know, hopefully they know that. But again, if you're running level one, this basement, it's probably as an introduction to players who are not as familiar with this and the, the tropes of the genre of mega dungeon crawling and all that. Uh, the undead party, it's harder to find that secret door. And um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of treasure in that treasury if you get back to it, but not an insane, insane amount. I mean, you're looking at a lot of money, a thousand gold. Uh, well, that's just the ebony and ivory image. Uh, all told, the gold objects weigh 25 pounds. It's kind of heavy to take them out, but not impossibly heavy to get out. Uh, you get vast uh, vat storage, the feasting carcass creepers, with some uh, tricks there. Also a map, which is really great, and some obscure annotations. I like that. <laughs> and I like the fact that you get one boot from a pair of elven boots, and the other is on floor three. So if you happen to find floor three, the other the other boot, then you can put them together. You're like, hey, I have a pair of one half of magic boots. I'm going to hold on to it, because who knows if I can find the other one. And then maybe you find the other one later. Uh, a Sturge Lair with uh, one of these teleportation circles in it, which the players I like are going to be like, I don't know how this works. But the fact that it's right here at the surface means that you can use this, right? Once the players later on find out how they, how they are to use these teleportation circles, then they can start to come here and use this one and teleport to different parts of the dungeon. So this is a great... Um, you know, near the surface teleportation circle that they, I'm sure, will use once they discover it and they discover how to use the, the patterns and, and know where they go. Great piece of art at the end of level one, the basement. Then we get to level two, the Howling Caves. I'm going to zoom in here a little bit uh, on this map. The Howling Caves and the Well of Light. Now, this is a really, really, really cool level of the dungeon. I like this... A dungeon a lot. It, it it's as I said, it's a little tonally different than the rest. I mean, in some ways, it's it's similar. It's a it's a private level of the priests of Toth, so it's got that Toth theme going on. 
You've got parts of it that are worked and parts of it that are unworked. You've got connections through the Great Chasm to the lower levels and lots of different floor connections. This has a lot of different connections. As you'll see, this is one of the places where I did, um, <laughs> I connected the, uh, I connected them with hyperlinks. So as you guys can see here, I, I, I made sure to uh, be able to connect the floors. And I think that that's um, cool. If you, I would recommend doing that, making the map uh, hyperlinked so that you know where you're going at any one time. Now, to get to this, you have to go down the well, and the well is quite long. So it's actually kind of hard, I, I would say, to, to get to. Because it, to easily get here, just through the easy access, you have to go down the well. And if you don't have enough rope, players might say, do we really want to go down the well first? Let's go to the, let's go to the pyramid first. So I actually don't think that level two will be explored before level three. I think you're probably going to find level three is initially the exploration place. But there are other ways to get down here, obviously. Um, and, and there are places where this, you know, this, this goes off to other places as well. <laughs> uh, so you can find this from a couple different access points. Um, Ardenville has at least three ways that I know of getting here. But they're all not terribly obvious. So I think the well is likely where people are going to come down, and it's also going to be where um, where there's a bit of a hesitation, because are we really going to climb down this really deep well? <laughs> Let's just go to that. So despite the fact that this is level two, I could easily see most parties not finding this until much later. Yeah. Now, I like what's going on here with these baboons. The fact that they're being led by this, you know, crazy druid, the fact that there are not really factions among them. This is one thing I really like about it is that there are definitely loyalties here and definitely different power centers without being a huge, huge like faction thing. It's not like there's different factions amongst the baboons who are going to turn on each other. But there's enough different difference with the different giant intelligent ones with different motivations, things that they want that you could probably drive a wedge as a clever party or as a very, you know, a very, um, yeah, clever party. They could find a way to manipulate things going on here and turning things to their advantage. Um, another awesome trick here is the, the mirror trick. The whole, not the whole place, but on the map you can see all the places that are marked M, those are the mirrors that direct the light, and the baboons don't do well with the light. So you can easily make this place safer and uh, more manageable, especially room 35, which could otherwise be a really tricky fight. Um, I think if you if you just lighted everything up with the mirrors and then rushed into 35, suddenly that fight would be a lot easier, as opposed to kind of what it is if everybody's in there, you know, and you just decide to fight that. Um, yeah, it's going to be tough uh, as a low level party, especially. So you get the uh, the dungeon itself. Uh, you get the encounter tables for the majority of level two, but you do have different encounter tables for different parts of the level. The Well of Light and the areas around it, the Invocation of Light, the Reception of Light, the Glorification of Light, the Concealing of Light, all the different uh, sub-chambers -ch right around the main floor. Um, now, really quickly, in Room 7, which is uh, right there, right? Uh, room 7 is just right off the side. You get a note on one of the corpses that says, They are deterred by light. We should restore the well. So, it's a good clue. And that's another thing this dungeon does really well. Sometimes they're a little... I would say on the nose, the clues, but that's fine. It's better than being really super subtle, right? <laughs> Players are not often super subtle. So sometimes giving a clue that's like, hey, do this thing and it will help you is, is really good. And there's, believe me, there's enough subtlety in some of the clues down here that it's nice to have a more explicit, clear one from time to time. The Pyramid of Venerable Age is a connection to level the level three, which is kind of funny rather than anything more than that. It's, it's, it's an interesting little like teleportation trick. It's kind of cool, though. I like it. Um, the same thing with the antechamber of the Oracle. It connects down below, but it's sort of an interesting little one-off section of Floor 3. It doesn't connect you to the whole of Floor 3. And what's going on there, that, that's an incredibly powerful Oracle. It's also pretty dangerous, so you got to be careful about it. Which, again, it's something that you're going to run into throughout this whole dungeon, is stuff that's clear, stuff that's not. Or stuff, I should say, that's useful and dangerous simultaneously. The same thing in, with Room 63. So you have that with room 10 and the oracle down there going down to room floor 3. But also with room 63 where you can ask to see and ask ask for a whisper or hear a whisper. There, it's a random table what you hear, but it can be up to and including really crazy stuff. Um, 
Now the, the left section, the west section, all this stuff over here, which is kind of, I mean, it's not all closed off. Parts of it, is, parts of it are. It's certainly less used by the baboons as, uh, you know, all the section 17, 18, 19, 20, all that stuff. That's pretty dangerous with these undead and the teleportation circle and the tricks and traps there. Uh, the same thing with room 31. There's this hidden room with a pretty fun trap there with a demon that doesn't want to be let out, does kind of want to be let out. Um, or no, he does want to be let out, but he's trying to trick you into doing it. And, and to, yeah, it's just an interesting, <laughs> again, role-playing sort of encounter. It's going to be totally different than the rest of this portion of the dungeon. And that's great, shifting back and forth. Um, let's see. Oh, oops, wrong, wrong one. One thing that you see a lot on this floor is prisoners. The the um, the baboons have captured a lot of prisoners, and there's a lot of like, uh, I don't know. Throughout this whole dungeon, there's a lot of like chained maidens who aren't wearing much, and you know some tables are not going to like that, so change that accordingly. I've noticed that a lot on two, you know, tables two and three or, or rooms two and <laughs> floors two and three. Excuse me. Um, yeah, that's just going to be tonally what your your table wants or not. So keep that in mind. And there's a lot of stuff, obviously, you always have to do that with the dungeon, but I would say there's a fair amount of, of gore and disturbing disturbing things that you're going through and also that sort of stuff, which you just want to, you know, if you have a younger table or something like that, maybe maybe modify um, the ghoul sections. There's a lot of cannibalism and, and desperation and despair, and it's it's pretty, pretty, pretty dark. Uh, makes sense that it would be, and I think a lot of tables aren't going to care at all, but some would, so you'd want to be careful about that. The, uh, the, the the baboons are kind of the main thing here, right? You're dealing with the different baboons. Cisco uh, is one of them who is aggressive and intelligent. He's Garalad's main lieutenant. He's feared by almost all of the denizens of level two. His Archontean is clear if halting, and occasionally likes to put on human clothes to see what he looks like. <laughs> so it's kind of funny. You could you could use some uh, you know what you might you might you'd say you could uh, some fun role playing with Cisco there. Um, there's also Burris who is a uh, captured person here. But most of the prisoners um, are out in 35 and in the cells by there. There's also Trefko, who is the other, or one of the other giant baboons. He's an old canny baboon. Um, and he is not as interested. He's willing to talk before turning hostile. He's not going to go against the wishes of Gerlad, nor can he be tempted to act against the other giant intelligent baboons. That said, Trefko is no friend of Sisko and is unlikely to come to Sisko's assistance if he hears fighting. So it's an interesting dynamic there. You're not, he's not likely to come to someone else's aid, but he's not going to betray them. So if you meet him first, you could maybe convince him to be neutral. And that, again, this is what I mean. Like, There's not a lot of like actual factions on this floor, but there is enough role-playing between the leading baboons, and there's an, it could be enough role-playing with Garalad and his um, Isocrates uh, assistant guy, who doesn't really like him too much. There's enough, like, different motivations by the different characters, the different personalities uh, by the different uh, people here that you could interact with and manipulate and try to work with. It's not, it's not as simple as one faction versus another faction choose a side, right? You have to do much more, you have to do more work in order to get those factions to work out that way. But you could do it, and a, and a canny party could certainly do it. I like that a lot. I think that makes it um, more interesting. And again, it's not as simple. Sometimes it is. On other floors, it's much more simple. It's like this faction hates that faction. You know, pick one side or, or manipulate them to fight each other. This is not the case on floor two. Floor two is one big tribe of baboons with different personalities that could maybe be manipulated or used against each other. Uh, and then, of course, there's plenty of NPCs to rescue or find because they like to take prisoners, especially in 36, the cells of eternal anxiety. doesn't sound very good. You get Nijal, Oakheart, Samantha the Red, you get Trusty, Iridel, uh, Guelph, and then Jost of Newmarket. Now, one of these guys, I forget which one, is it, uh, is it Nijal? I think it's Nijal, yeah. He's been charmed, and so he's just his, uh, he's, the, he's the jailer now. Um, you could try to break him free, and I think that would be cool. If you somehow knew that he had been charmed ahead of time, maybe that could be part of your goal is to rescue him or someone in these cells. I could see that being an initial early quest line, right? Maybe you're hired to find Samantha, or maybe you're hired to find Jost, 
because uh, he's only been in prison for a week, uh, and it's still therefore filled with hope, right? So um, it seems to me that you could uh, you could have an easy adventure hook to one of these characters, and that would give you the party a good reason to start exploring. But there's no way you're going to be able to rescue them quickly or easily. I mean, if there's no punishment going on in room 35, then it's a little bit quieter. You could maybe fight your way in. But even finding them, first of all, would be tricky. So this seems to me it would be a great initial hook or quest to find one of these people. I think a lot of parties would, could, do, could do a lot worse. A lot of GMs could do a lot worse than kind of giving this as an initial reason to start exploring. Maybe, maybe they're all part of it. It doesn't say this, but you could make it that they're all part of one adventuring party. Maybe they've all been captured and someone has hired you to find this old adventuring party. Um, the funerary cave. Now, one of the things I really like is once you start to cross over to the other side of the chasm, there's cool stuff happening over here, especially the connection down to the large obelisk. But it's also pretty hard to find in a lot of cases. <laughs> a lot of, a lot of, oh, it's really hard to find um, ways to get across, and and so this is not something I expect most parties to run into or to find. It just it really isn't. That's another thing here is like. There are so many opportunities to find interesting things. You're like, well, man, my party is going to take forever to go through a particular region because there's so much stuff to find. Well, the party's not going to find it all. Right? A party might find one out of every five or six interesting secret doors, say. I mean, if, if the odds are one in six or one in four, one in eight, yeah, that's about right. You're going to find one in six or one in four. So a lot of this stuff you're just not going to find unless you have maps of it or clues to it or the party gets really lucky or I guess unlucky, <laughs> depending on how you look at it. But so part of the part of this dungeon, you know, it's funny, it's gonna feel a lot smaller to a lot of your party a lot of your parties than it actually is. Because they're just not gonna find all the stuff that it that it is the how big it is. Right? So they're not gonna find all of these rooms. So you could feel a little bit better, I think. Because in my mind I was like, man, there's so much cool stuff the players are never gonna see. I feel bad about that. On the other hand, there's so much stuff that's hidden, they're going to find some of it. So the question isn't really, in what order are they going to clear this dungeon? The question really is, what are they going to find and what are they not going to find? That's sort of the question in the mind of the GM. And, you know, if you really want them to see something, give them a map to it, right? Or maybe an NPC tells them about it, or maybe the secret door happens to be open when they pass by, you know, whatever it is. If you really want them to see something, you can, you can tip the scales a little bit and get them to see it. Um... Once you get down to the other babu uh, the other layer here, you have one of the features of the dungeon that I really like, which is the sort of fantastic plausibility in terms of that decanter of endless water in the pool. It's typical of, I've mentioned this in my last video, but it's on this subject, but it's typical of the dungeon as a whole, where it's implausible, or it's plausible with a fantastical twist, right? Like, how are the baboons alive? Well, they have to have water. Okay, well, where are they getting water from? Well, there's a a decanter of endless water in this that's been that's been filling and they have you know just enough to 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 consume it and it and it, they consume enough that it doesn't overflow and fill the, the cavern okay plausible enough that i'm not bothered by it and there's a lot of that in this dungeon right like the chimneys have they're like you know like like, like in kitchens for example on floor two and floor three there are kitchens like, well, where, why doesn't it just fill with smoke? Why isn't everything covered in grease? And it's like, well, maybe there's a little bit of smoke and grease in here, but no, no, there's actually a chamber, uh, a chimney that, you know, that uh, lets the smoke go out into a larger cavern somewhere. It's like, all right, fair enough, cool. That's fine. <laughs> I don't mind that. Um, how is it that this faction has not come into contact with that faction? Um, well, the one passageway between them collapsed. And so they and they don't go exploring much. Like, all right, fair enough. <laughs> and then most of the time, they, they do know of other factions there. On floor three, there's one particular faction that uh, surprised me. I'll talk about it more. And the question of how is how is nobody else aware of it? Well, you could obviously make them aware of it. But I think you could, I think the dungeon could be really actually enhanced by making them very aware of each other. I'll talk more about that on level three. Um, you get a couple more intelligent baboons. You get Yamki and Umsko who are both uh, down there. Uh, Umsko is particularly cruel, not not fun. Um, and Yamki is, uh, is uh, well, <laughs> he is, I don't know what you would say, um, a big, nasty uh, baboon who wants to kill everybody. Um, 
You get the chef down here as well. Oh, well, here's the, the Hall of Whispers. Actually, I talk about that first. The Hall of Whispers. Um, it's interesting because you you have to roll first on the kind of whisper you receive. So mundane, ancient, mundane, modern, interesting, ancient, interesting, modern, or dangerous. You have only a one in twelve chance of getting a dangerous one. You're very likely to get a mundane one, either ancient or modern. And the mundane messages are really mundane. They don't do anything really. I mean, some of them have references, therefore could be useful, but many of them don't. Lizard tastes like like chicken. <laughs> I never thought I'd love baboon stew this much. My dad thinks I'm already the high priest, and now he's coming to visit. I've got to get some help. Totally ancient, useless. Now, what's interesting is that more of the modern mundane whispers are actually interesting, or at least relate to interesting characters. Not always. Um, man, I hate baboons. Let's get out of here. Doesn't doesn't help you. But once you start getting to the dangerous whispers, well, the interesting ones are all cool too, but once you get to the dangerous ones, they're actually fairly dangerous, right? Uh, I am coming for you, PC's name. I know what you did to someone specific or at some specific place, and you will pay, GM's choice. All right, so now there's a guy chasing you down, and you know it. Uh, booming voice, for that I pronounce anathema upon you. PC is cursed, and a D6 table for the curse that, uh, that happens. Oops, a randomly determined monster is summoned into the hall and attacks. All right, right? <laughs> So there's, there's some really actually dangerous ones. Although, granted, it's a 1 in 12 chance and then a d20 to see what will actually happen. But all of them are dangerous. Uh, so, 1 in 12 chance of this being actually a fairly dangerous place. The Great Chasm is really cool. Here's the kitchen. <laughs> uh, with uh, with Ursko, who is, uh, I believe, yeah, the, the cook, Ursko. And uh, there's a skeletal cook as well. Pretty great, with some recipe books. Isocrates half hand. Uh, this is the other element of the, um, you might say, negotiation that can occur on this floor. Isocrates is an apprentice, sort of, uh, an Archontean Arcan magic user who's come here who's agreed to work in order to get access to the library. Probably not going to die for Garalad or for, um, for the apes, or for the baboons, I should say. Probably not interested in that. So if push comes to shove, this could be someone that you could interact with and maybe turn on other people. Um, if you promised that there was like, hey, you can keep working here, right? Um, but uh, he loathes baboons, and it, and it even says uh, that a quick thinking and clever party would negotiate with him. Given certain incentives and securities, he might even be persuaded to abandon Garland. Yeah, exactly. So I think this is a great element. Someone who is kind of respected, who has the command, you could turn him to your side. And it's also fairly possible to find him. Now, granted, the, the doors are double, well, double doors are locked. If you have a thief, you can pick the lock. Or if if he's in here, you can knock on it or try to open the door. But if, if the party just goes south right away once they come down the well, then they might run into him right away. They might not. might not go in any direction. But if they go south, they might run into him right away. In which case, that's a whole thing that the dungeon could be um, used. Now, if you wanted, if you really wanted the players to have this interaction with him and to meet him and to have the chance to negotiate, then maybe they hear his voice echoing up the hall from the south because as he's yelling at one of the baboons or something like that, right? Then, then they have a reason to go there. So there's stuff you can do as a GM to move the dungeon around a little bit and to bring the stuff forward that you want to bring forward. And I think that would be one of them. So floor two, overall, a great... <laughs> it's really interesting. And there's that secret library too, which has a lot of stuff in there, a lot of scrolls, uh, clerical scrolls. I like Floor 2. I think it's a really cool um, introduction to... Well, not introduction. It's in the dungeon itself, but it's, it's again, it's tonally different enough. It's harder to find than Hall 3. I think probably you're not going to go into Hall 2 right away. Hall 3, the Halls of Toth, seems to be where most parties will start off the actual mega dungeon of Ardenvolt. At least it seems to me. Now, Floor 3 is where things get serious. This is a huge, huge floor. And I'll, I'll go back. The last one was 70 rooms or so. This is, what, 230? 220? Yeah, 220 rooms. So we're talking about a different scale entirely. This has distinct zones and regions, different factions. And in fact, one of the things I really like is, let me go to this. I found another, yeah, I found another um, PDF. I think you can get this on Drive for RPG for free. But it's all the maps with the zones of control for the dungeon listed. So you get at a glance, you can see who's in charge where if in, in floors with different factions. That's super cool. So you've got the halflings, 
um, up in yellow on this map. You've got the Set Cult in green. They have a little outpost down in the south. You've got the uh, the uh, Beastmen in blue. Uh, and then you've got Androsia, who is the Hag. And she's the one I was talking about where it surprised me. I didn't really know that there was a, a, a Hag on this floor. Um, and I think that could be really cool in a way to like start interacting with the Beastmen. Uh, that that connection through the secret door in what is that the secret oops the secret door between uh, 130 and 220 uh, 220 what is that 221 yeah this place right here uh, that little passage connects the beastmen and the hag and I can totally see the hag having you know she has some like enchanted beastmen servitors I could see that being a, a, a way of getting friendly with one faction or the other is, is they're causing trouble for each other or the hag wants something that Dino has or Dino, I think it's Dino that's what I always say, Dino and or Dino wants the hag destroyed because she's drawing from that power maybe there's a connection between those two in their past right, and so they're, they're rivals and stuff, I mean there's a lot of stuff you could do so I like that a lot and then of course there's the goblins and the halflings who are fighting by room 7 um, so a great, a great this one's much more faction heavy I mean, not, not only factions. You're dealing with a lot of empty rooms and stuff. Well, not empty rooms, but non-faction controlled rooms, I should say. But generally, it's much more, um, uh, much more faction heavy than floor two or floor one. Much more like the rest of the dungeon, I think, in that regard. I also really like that right away you get this puzzle with the giant statue in room two, which, in order to access the the secret treasury in twenty three and twenty four. You have to solve the puzzle with all the different statues scattered around the dungeon. So it's not just it's not just something you have to solve right there. You're going to have to go around. Even if you discover it, even if you realize what's going on, you have to continue uh, to hunt around through the rest of the dungeon, right? <laughs> and then, of course, there are these halflings, which at first, I will admit, I was kind of like, this is weird. Like a bunch of halflings who are just like, you know, robbing people who come through. Yeah, actually, it makes total sense. You have a, a, a safe place in three, relatively safe, save for the tunnel with the goblins, that is, and of course the Great Chasm, you have a, a relatively safe place which overlooks one of the key passages up and down the dungeon. Of course someone's going to try to take a, advantage of that. It makes perfect logical sense. That it's halflings, and a gang of halflings is funny, because that's not usually how you see halflings in games, but that's cool, and that's not, that's not a problem. I like this a lot, a lot more than I initially did when I first read it. These halfling, this halfling gang, I think that could be really interesting. And, you know, part of it you could use to your advantage if you wipe them out, if you find a way to. Well, that's one thing, but if you don't, I mean, you know, you could convince them to help you, right? You have, that you found where there's a lot of treasure down below. Maybe they can help you. Maybe they can guarantee you passage through this passage for a certain regular cut. Maybe they can deny other adventuring parties access if you pay them a certain amount, right? I mean, there's stuff you could do with this faction as opposed to just seeing it as a hostile faction that could be really interesting. Um, and as a GM, I think you'd want to encourage that sort of negotiation rather than seeing this as a, a threat that needs to be defeated. Make it much more of a rival, maybe evil, that can be used. You know, there are going to be some parties that are like, nope, you can't take any of our treasure, we're going to kill you all. I think a good number of parties are going to be like that. But maybe try to find a way to negotiate with this party and uh, and make it more interesting. You know, to, to turn it into a regular uh, feature of this dungeon floor. Because I imagine if the players do start on floor 3 and they're like, hey, we're going to loot it, they're going to be looting it for a while. I mean, this, is, this is a long, long time. Just this one floor. There's a lot of treasure here. A lot of treasure. The goblins are kind of interesting too in that connection to the goblins here. There's some interesting chambers right away. The Chamber of Painful Knowledge and the cha Pool of Youth. Those are very cool too, and I like that they're right here. So if the players find out what they are and how to use them, then they have access to healing regularly, once a week, basically. Um, over and over and over. They can always come back to this pool and drink it and be healed a little bit. So if they're coming out of a dungeon and they're really hurt, then that's one way of doing it. Or if they've been out of the dungeon for a while, they've been trying to rest up and it's going slow, they're healing slowly, they can say, well... It's been a week. Let's go into the dungeon. We'll drink from the fountain. Maybe it'll heal us to full, and then we can continue on from there. So it's a cool little boost once you figure it out. It's right near the entrance. I like that design quite a lot. Um, 
there are a few uh, dangerous traps. The whole the whole 15, 16, 17 room is kind of interesting. And uh, that secret door into room 17 is, is quite good because you can find a ton of stuff. The uh, This is the tomb where I think you find the, um, the sarcophagus itself, yeah, is worth, or each of them, the two sarcophagi are each worth 2,500 gold pieces, but they're 500 pounds. Now, there are things like this throughout the dungeon where you find this incredibly valuable thing. It's super heavy and awkward. How are we ever going to get it out? I would not hand wave that. Do not say, yeah, you guys get it out. No, 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 that's a part of this dungeon. There's tons and tons of very valuable things that are awkward or heavy or hard to get out. Getting them out without creatures attacking them, without rival adventurers stealing from them, without the halflings demanding a share, whatever it is, that's part of this dungeon. So if the players are insisting on getting these heavy objects out of the dungeon, I would say do not, do not give in to the temptation to be like, yeah, yeah, sure, yeah, they, you get it fine. No problem whatsoever. <laughs> no. And it, this one isn't so bad. I mean, it's just past 15 and then down the hall to 17. So if you find it, you can easily get back to the entrance. This is relatively close. So this is the sort of, a sort of introduction to this concept of heavy things, how do we get it out? This floor has an entire section that is very hard to access and navigate the catacombs. Um, there's not a whole lot of reason to go there initially, like why you would push past the catacombs. But there are, uh, the, the, the passageway down to sub-level 12 is a serious one. And if the party ever really starts to interact with Kerborg Khan, they're going to have to find this way. <laughs> they're going to have to go through this part. There's also a gelatinous cube down here, which I really like. I always like gelatinous cubes. I'm glad that they have one in the dungeon. And there's some treasure hordes. I mean, you know, we're not to, we're not to uh, discount that. Um, although not, not right away. The treasure hoard that, that is referenced here, of course, is the secret door underneath the statue that you have to follow. I like that. It's cool. Um, you get the, uh, uh, just a lot of treasure. <laughs> I mean, this is the, the treasury of the, of the cult of Toth, or of the, uh, the religion of Toth, and so it's like, it makes sense that there's going to be just a ton, a ton, a ton of valuables here. So, yeah. But it's hard to get to, because you have to solve the puzzles of the statues. Uh, in 15, in 2A, and in 40, I believe. Um, Hall of Scrutiny, uh, the tomb of Hithra Paleologos. Paleologos? I don't know how to say that. Paleologos. It's like a, a chess puzzle. And that's su super cool. I like chess puzzles in games. I love chess myself. And uh, this is fun. I think some players could really like this. Now, it's sort of a chess puzzle slash combat where things are getting destroyed, right? <laughs> Um, but you do have to figure it out. You don't have to play a game of chess so much, but you do have to know what you're talking about in terms of chess pieces. And you could either, if none of your players are chess players, you might have to tell them what it means. But the pieces are themselves uh, really cool looking. And the idea of them, archons, dragons, high priests, sorcerers, cataphracts, and legionaries. That's just so cool. I love it. Really, really cool stuff. You get the Great Chasm and all of the... Uh, Stuff that you can run into here, giant spiders, bats, mantari, giant centipedes. But the idea of the chasm itself, which is technically an access to much of the dungeon, although good luck navigating it, right? You're looking at 1,600 feet. So not the sort of thing you just easily navigate down to the bottom of. But the fact that it's sort of a connecting chimney throughout the entire dungeon is awesome. All the way down to the very bottom of the cavern floor. I love that. Love, love, love that. And I think that's super cool. <laughs> Even though you're not going to necessarily navigate it from the beginning, unless you have fly. But again, you're not going to get that until later. Uh, on the far side of it are a lot of really cool dungeons. A lot of really cool traps and tricks and things you got to deal with. Um, Menas, the Legothet. Um, different ancient tombs you can run into. The Magic Fountain there with some really permanent effects. Like, for example, an hour of fly. That's awesome. Um... Now, one of the things you could do is you could roll different durations and magical effects each time instead of just reading straight across. That'd be kind of interesting. Um, but if you, yeah, you could risk permanent flight <laughs> or permanent donkey ears if you did that. So you know, be, be wary of doing that. The Hall of Mysteries, and that's a really interesting thing. You have to, it just Like, this side of the chasm feels much more mega-dungeon-y, wild, random. Not random, but mega-dungeon-y, wild, 
crazy stuff the players are going to do than the other side of the chasm, at least on this floor. Um, you get Laryl One-Eye, which is a whole thing. Really interesting. You can become possessed with his spirit, and it's not necessarily a good thing. Um, Jake and the Proud. Uh, you get the Pit of Fire. That's also really cool. Now, one of the dangers here is that if you say the word transported, I don't know why you would say it or think it, you just access, you just get to the City of Brass. Um, that's, I mean, then you're, they're there. So that character's just gone, right? Unless you're in a very high level campaign or they get here at a very high level. They're just gone. So, <laughs> you know, keep that in mind. That's basically a death trap, although they're not dead exactly. It could be the start of a new campaign if you wanted. Kind of interesting. You get some references to the ancient aliens down here, the Rishvas, and this is another reason why this is sort of an introduction to that kind of idea of the Mega Dungeon as well. It's not something you really see on level 2 or in level 1, but you do find it in level 3, for sure. Uh, creepy art here. I love that art. Um, going through, you know, a little bit more... Not quickly, I would say, because it's not. It's going to be quick. <laughs> I wanted to talk about the two, well, three, I guess, major sections of this dungeon once you start to move um, to the the west side. And that is the, the stuff with Set, and then the stuff with the Beastmen, and then, of course, obviously the Great Canyon, or Cavern, with the Mushrooms. Those are the three big things on this floor, as I, as I see it, once you get past the initial areas. And the, the set stuff is really cool because it connects to level 4. Now, I'm not going to do that in this video. It's already going really long. But really, to explain the stuff about set, you'd have to go through to the next floor and talk about the forum of set and all the stuff down there. And that's all awesome. I love that stuff. It's one of the coolest parts of this level of the dungeon. So in a way, it's going to be incomplete to talk about it without it. But there's just a lot of cool stuff going on here. A lot of cool stuff with big fights, the big Temple of Set. Like, if you, you can find your way into the Temple of Set from this floor, but it's actually going to be kind of hard to fight your way into it from this from this side. More likely, you're going to come at the Temple of Set from the other way, down floor four, and then coming up into the Temple at level three. At least that's what seems to me more likely, uh, rather than coming at it through this back way. But I do like that you could come to it through this back way on floor three. That's pretty cool. Great pieces of art here, and a, a really intense fight. If you start fighting in room 90, I mean, you're going to be fighting a lot of stuff, so low-level parties are going to get wrecked if they just jump into this dungeon and start fighting. That's why I don't think probably they're going to find their way to it from this floor. I mean, because to do so, what, you have to kind of go through room 81. You can find your way up through 113. That's really hard. But otherwise, you kind of have to go through, you have to find the secret door into 81. You have to find the concealed door past 81. And then you have to get through the barricade into 89. Uh, it's pretty tough. I don't think you're likely to do that. More likely, it seems to me, you're going to find this from level 4 or maybe level 5. Uh, yeah, this is much more likely to me. Which I like. I'm glad. I think that's cool. Um, there's some torturers, once again. Lots of people being tortured. <laughs> you can find that throughout this whole dungeon. And the prisoners of Set. With some interesting connections to different place, also places back in Newmarket places back in the world, but also places in the dungeon. Um, you find some, uh, for example, a fishman and a goblin captain, who uh, Gribble is actually connected to and other goblins on this floor, so that would be kind of a cool connection. Um, hidden tomb, there's all, lots of hidden tombs throughout. There's the Oracle of Toth, which connects to that one small passage on the surface that I talked about before. Um, the Fountain of Knowledge, really cool, but dangerous. Kind of a, a you know a mixed blessing, if you will. Now the other part that I want to talk about that's really cool is the Beastmen. Once you get to the Great Hall of the Beastmen, the Beastmen are obviously one of the major features, in my opinion, of this floor. Really cool that they're I don't know they're just like a Roman legion, disciplined and yet or uh, disciplined and organized, but bestial. It's very different than I tend to think of the chaotic Beastmen from you know Warhammer Fantasy or something like that. It's not what we're dealing with here. They're organized, they're difficult, and they're, they're disciplined. If the players make an enemy of them, it's going to be hard to deal with. Unless they can somehow find a way to deal with Dino herself directly. If they can do that, then it seems to me you're going to start to have, depending on which of the sort of sub-captains the Counts takes over, you're going to have to deal with a different kind of Beastman. But that's a huge deal. I mean, like that whole idea of turning the Beastman into a an ally or an enemy based on which count is still alive or if you deal with Dino or not, that's really cool. You might just have to destroy them all, 
maybe you don't deal with them at all. Maybe they're just, you can't really maneuver through the 123s into the big uh, fungal forest beyond unless you find other paths, which is totally reasonable. You don't have to go through the upper portion of the dungeon to the lower portion of the dungeon by moving through the, the halls of the beastmen. Um, or you can find your way through the secret door into 221 or up to floor 39, or maybe just try to skip fight your way through the beast. It, it just, this serves as a, as a, as a dividing line between the upper halls of Toth, which, you know, of uh, this part of the map up here, and the caves beyond. You kind of have to deal with the Beastmen or find a way to negotiate with them or pass through. But with Dino there, you're, she's not just going let, to let people walk through, and the Beastmen aren't going to let people walk through. So this is a whole deal. This could be the source the subject of a long portion of the campaign. At least, it seems to me. And I like that, because I like these guys. They're really cool. There's a lot of cool stuff happening here. I, I like the counts. They're all interesting. They're different, and therefore they're going to be the sorts of things that, you know, depending on who you're talking to, depending on which one you end up siding with, depending on which one the players like. And and all of this is assuming that, that this is a thing of interest to the players. They might not see the Beastmen as anything but a foe to be defeated. They might see them as difficult and therefore to be avoided. It's just here, right? It's another part of this uh, dungeon. There's a lot of stuff like this, just... Uh, a thing that is awesome, that is detailed and fleshed out and has a lot of different dimensions to it, it's up to you. There's also some connections to the Varumani, because they have some advisors sent from the Troll Thane in level 730, so you could connect to that too. Advise and observe, Dino. And there's Dino herself, who is a cool kind of quasi-lich. Um, and then you get into the Great Caverns. Oh man, I love this whole place. The tone immediately shifted for me. Instead of being, you're like in a jungle, right? It's a fungal jungle with a lake, and suddenly you're dealing with sturges, and you're dealing with these yeah, mu mushrooms and, and predators that hunt in there, and there's the lake itself, which is really cool. And man, it just it suddenly changed its tone entirely once you get into the fungal jun dun uh, dungeon. And I love this whole section. It's huge, and it is going to be disconcerting to the players and disorienting. They can get lost. I love it. Love it, love it, love it. It's straightforward in one sense in that you're not dealing with like, you know, crazy complex factions out here the way that you are in the Beastmen and the, the sort of dynamics of NPCs. This is much more encounters and creatures and traps and tricks. Uh, there's the, the pavilion and the gargantuan chair, which is really cool. And then there are these doors into 177 and then the just the passageways behind them, if the players find them, if they happen to find them. They're likely, it seems to me, to find the cave into 172A over here on the right side of the map because there is a path that leads to it. And the paths are easy to follow. The rest of the jungle is not so easy to follow, but the paths are. So that's an easy cavern to find, and then they just simply follow it all the way down to 177 and the big double doors. They're less likely, it seems to me, to find the stairs up to 175. Although they could. They could simply go down from the path, hit the pillar and then find their way around to the stairs so it wouldn't be hard but there's a lot of cool stuff going on here too a lot of cool stuff and this opens up to me another or it reveals to me another aspect of this dungeon that i love and that's simply there's no way through it no one way through it i mean how are the players going to approach this literally any way they want i mean there's so many different ways to go from this portion of the dungeon into 227 uh, into 200, into 171 in this side bit over here, uh, into 180 or 172A and going around, going up through 176, going all the way down to 197, going down into 194. Just, again, so many ways of going through this place. I love it. Love it, love it, love it. You run into some goblins down here, and then, of course, this is where you run into the hag. And uh, that whole side faction, which I think is so cool, I think it's a great way of connecting and interacting with the Beastmen. I think more could be done there than is done with the hag and her interests and Dino and her interests and their relation to each other. I think that would be one way because when the players first encounter this, I don't think there's necessarily going to be any reason for the beast men to pay attention to them or vice versa. But I think if Dino herself doesn't want to go out and deal with anything and the beast men have, have been showing no luck dealing with the hag, well, then maybe the players could. And that might be a way of giving the players access to the fungal jungle and to the caves beyond without dealing with the beast men in military ways. It'd be a way of going through. So I think that could be really cool. And of course, there is the uh, access to the uh, the set cult 
this back door as well, then to 159, and that's another way to go as well. Map into the form of set. Well, this is all I'm going to do for this video. Um, just, I love these floors. I love how they're connected. I think there's a great material here for so many, so many cool adventures. Um, just these three floors. Now, I think floor three is, is made a lot cooler with four floor in the form of set. But leaving that aside, this is super cool. Uh, anyway, that's all I'm going to do for this one. <laughs> if you guys are interested in another video on this topic, um, let me know. I'm happy to go through more levels. But otherwise, I will let you guys all go and see you in another video.